it took me about a year to make the adjustment to Hawaii from New York. But once I did, uh, probably the last three years of college were among the best years of my life. I really enjoyed Hawaii, I enjoyed the culture, and even though I did not knock the ball out of the park in school here, uh, I got through school and I got through life and I supported myself and I, I made it. Join us for a conversation with University of Hawaii Manoa alumnus Richard Parsons, chairman of Citigroup. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Welcome to Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. New York native Richard Parsons came to Hawaii at age 16 to receive a college education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He would become one of the most prominent figures in the business world and an advisor to six American presidents, Republican and Democrat. At the time of this taping in April of 2009, Richard Parsons was just a couple of months into a new job as chairman of the troubled financial services giant Citigroup. As busy as he was during the economic turmoil of the time, Richard Parsons returned to the UH Manoa for a week, as promised, as the awardee of the 2009 Dan and Maggie Inoue Chair in Democratic Ideals. In this first part of a two-part conversation, we'll start with Parsons' upbringing. His middle-class African-American parents moved the family from Brooklyn to Queens and made it clear that a good education and good grades were building blocks of the American dream. Uh, I didn't consider rebelling because, you know, parents and people have a way of, um, of letting you know what's non-negotiable, right? If, you, if, if a kid senses a crack or senses a weakness or a pause, you say, can I do this? And you go, well, I don't think it's right or something like that. Then they're all over you. If it's non-negotiable, you might as well move on because you're not going to move them. So this was a non-negotiable subject. You were expected to go on to college. Had your mother or your father at that time been to college? Both. Both, both. had. My mother hadn't graduated. My father had. But both had been to college. And he, he really, and both of them sort of appreciated the importance of education. And how far were you expected to go with your life? Well, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure I can really answer it. I think that, that they would say, were they still here, well, they would hope that you would go as far as your potential would take you. And did you have an early sign of your potential, where you would go, or how you would get there? <laughs> Um, that's a debatable subject, you know. I, I, I came back uh, on this trip and I had a birthday. I had a birthday a couple of days ago. And uh, some of my old fraternity brothers got together and threw this birthday party for me. And several of them I hadn't seen in 40 years, right? And one of them said to me, geez, I had no idea that, uh, that, that you were smart and that you would go this far. And the other one, another one of my fraternity brothers, without missing a beat, said, oh, Rich isn't smart, he's just, uh, you know, he just doesn't piss people off. <laughs> ah, but I've heard, um, I think it was a former next door neighbor of yours who, who came along later in your life and he said people, uh, he said you uh, actually like people to underestimate you and you, you work at it. Uh, I don't have to work at it, they just seem to. So if that was a sign of potential, maybe yes. Um, I did okay in school. I did okay in school. And you knew you were smart. I was clever enough. But I was not, for example, I was not the smartest kid on my, on my block. And I certainly wasn't the smartest kid in our school. And yet later you would be, I think, one of 3,600 law school grads applying for the New York State Bar and you would score the highest number? Well, that was a, that was a fallow year. See, you underestimate yourself, or you want me to underestimate you, right? Okay, so you're, you're growing up um, with parents who, who expect you to do well and get, mm -hmm. get educated. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, actually, you went through school quickly, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, by, but were you living in a rough area, or was it the suburbs? Well, I was born in, um, in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, and that was 
pretty rough, and I think that's one of the reasons my father moved the family. It just was getting not better, it was getting worse in the 50s. Uh, and then we moved to an area at which at the time, as I said, was almost bucolic in terms of its rural splendors, but over time um, became, in a sense, um, a, a somewhat rough area so that, for example, the junior high school I went to was considered one of the worst in the city by the time we got to junior high school because it had gotten violent. So it was, it, was, uh, it was the city, you know, it was urban America. How did you navigate that? Did you get into fights? I did until I realized I wasn't very good at it. I must have lost 50 fights by the time I was in the sixth grade. So I thought, These are fist fights? Yeah, so I thought, there has to be a better way, right? What's that? Well, you learn to, um, y you learn to deal with people in, in a non-confrontational fashion or format. I mean, there's always, there, there is, at least it's been my experience, almost always an alternative to fighting. So if a guy wants to hijack your lunch money or just wants to fight you just because you... You know, you were there, weren't you? <laughs> they used to do that. You know, you'd come out of the lunchroom and you'd have the change on you. They'd take your lunch and your... There's sometimes when, 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 you know, you have to stand up to a bully. But frequently, um, you can use other techniques to get where you need to go. For example, how do you defuse a bully, a, 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 a humor, fight situation? Humor is one way. Well, you can't make fun of the guy who's challenging you. No, no, you, can, you, you can't make fun of him, but you can make fun of other things, or you can get people, you can get people to change their um, attitude, to change their approach, to change their sense of well-being. How did you do it? Give me an example. I'll give you two, because there are two different techniques. One was to self-effacing humor or self-depreciating humor, can frequently um, disarm somebody. Free, a lot of times, I mean, there are bullies in the world, but most people um, fight for defensive reasons, not for offensive reasons. They, they feel cornered or they feel uh, insulted or they feel sort of that they've been confronted and have to defend themselves. Um, another thing that, that turned out to be um, very beneficial when I was in high school, I learned, that, you know, I went to school in a place where, where smart kids were frequently picked on. I mean, it was not, it, it wasn't a cool thing to do well in school. Uh, but if you were an athlete, right, if you played on any of the sports teams, and particularly if you played on the basketball team, because we had a good basketball team, then the, the real toughs in the school would protect you because you were part of the team, right? We got to stand up for the team. So I played basketball and that, that was sort of a pass through high school because nobody could pick on the basketball guys while some really bad operators would come and upset your day. Well, you, were you six feet four in high school? Yeah, I was. And were you a naturally talented athlete or did you have to work at it? Had to work at it. I had to work at it. Um, it turned out I, I actually wasn't all that talented in, in the fullness of time I learned. I thought I was when I was in high school, but, but I had to work at it, but I did. I played a lot of ball. Richard Parsons graduated from high school at the age of 16. He had dreamed since the seventh grade of attending Princeton University, but the combination of financial constraints and wanting to break free of home led to his enrollment at the University of Hawaii in 1964. And as a lark, I applied to the University of Hawaii because um, I sat next to a gal from Hawaii in my junior year in physics course, and she was the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, hey, there must be a University of Hawaii. To be honest with you, I didn't even really know there was, with certainty that there was one, but I said, there must be. So I put it down on the SATs as my third choice. Uh, long story short, I got waitlisted at Princeton which meant I wasn't going to get any financial assistance, even if I got in. I got into CCNY, but it was really time to leave home. It was time to go away, and I got into Hawaii, and so I came out here. And how did you pay for college? Uh, I worked. My first year, I worked at the Pacific Biomedical Research Center. I don't even know if it's still out here. Basically, after school, washing test tubes and stuff, and then I had a night job at the Primo Brewery. You know, watching in those days, they recycled the bottles, and you had to watch them on the assembly line to make sure that there was nothing in them as they sort of came through, pull them off if there was. And then 
my sophomore and junior year, I worked at a place called Mark Center Garage downtown. Just I was uh, first I parked cars, and I was a night manager. And then my senior year, I worked for the Honolulu Gas Company, putting in gas pipe out in Hawaii Kai. But you're also on the basketball team. How'd yep. you do all that? Well, something had to come up short, right? Yes. Turned, <laughs> turned out to be school, so I was not. I was. I was not. I didn't make my mother proud, I'll put it that way, in terms of the grades I got when I was out here. And you're a history major? Yeah, I started out as a physics major, but uh, but that required more time and attention than all these other activities afforded me, so I became a history major. Did you take anything from here that has um, stood the test of time in terms of values, people? Uh, all of these um, experiences are, are, are platforms for whatever you go on to next, right? And I think that uh, you find most successful people, um, they didn't just go from nowhere to being hugely successful. It's a step process and they have, they have prior su success platforms. And for me, Hawaii became one. Uh, not only because I got an education here, but because, um, as you indicated, I was pretty young when I got out here, and I was very much on my own. And uh, I survived. You know, I made it. And very different culture. Expensive it, place to live. It was different. It took me about a year to make the adjustment to Hawaii from New York. But once I did, uh, probably the last three years of college were among the best years of my life. I really enjoyed Hawaii. I enjoyed the culture. and. Even though I did not knock the ball out of the park in school here, uh, I got through school and I got through life and I s supported myself and I, I made it. And that was, that was um, confidence instilling. That was something that for the rest of my life, um, I never had to really stop and think about, well, can I do this or, or, or what would happen to me if I failed? Because I believe in myself. Well, you, so you were 16 when you got here, mm -hmm. and uh, what, I, besides your um, youth, what was the hardest thing about that first year? Loneliness. Loneliness. Um, it was my first time really away from home. Not, you know, I'd gone to camp for two weeks or I'd go see, visit my grandmother in Virginia, but usually that was with family. This was the first time that I was out from under family and friends and relatives and everything that was familiar to me back in New York. And uh, I did okay in the fall semester because that's basketball, right? So the basketball team became my f extended family and my friends. But after basketball season, uh, I got lonely. And so that was, that was an adjustment. Did you find this an open society? Did people let you in? It's a good question. Um, it's a friendly society, but it, it, isn't, it isn't necessarily as welcoming um, as the tourist brochures suggest. It's different, and, and, and once you accommodate those differences, or at least aware of those differences, then people let you in. But, but it isn't as though they come up to you on the street and drag you and say, come with me, let me show you how to be a part of Hawaii. You have to find your way in. How did you find that way? Uh, ultimately, I sort of stopped resisting. That's always the first step, right? You stop trying to pretend that this is still New York, or and you you acknowledge that there are some differences, and then you kind of give in to the aloha spirit. And for me, I ended up uh, joining a local fraternity. Um, making a lot of local friends. Most of the guys on the basketball team were not from Hawaii. Uh, they were from other parts on the mainland. And so it was, it was a kind of a cloistered community. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of had to give that up and go local. And when I did, everything clicked. Were you, um, okay, we have a stereotypic New Yorker, right? Loud and aggressive. Whoa. Were you that way? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. You can I, say stereotypes about them, but yeah, I can deny them. I regard stereotypical <laughs> New Yorker, relatively sophisticated, urbane, witty, and charming. And that's how you always were, even in the beginning of college? <laughs> yeah, actually true. I'm, you know, the one thing most of the people who've known me 
for many, many years, going back to high school. But certainly in college, would say, geez, you haven't changed. You've gotten older, a little balder and fatter, but basically it's still you. <laughs> you your friends seem to speak really frankly with yeah, you. Yeah, well, they do, they do, they do. You know, um, one of your friends has said that you're very smooth and you're, you're a diplomat, you're a charmer, but you've got a killer instinct. Now, I bet you had it in basketball, and I bet you have it in business. What I would say is that I'm competitive as opposed to killer instinct. That sounds too much like uh, the kid who lost too many fights when he was in grade school. I'm competitive, I don't like to lose. Now, what's interesting is, because I've, I've thought about this a lot, I don't mind um, if everybody wins, right? If we all get to the finish line simultaneously and we're all winners, but I just don't like to lose. At the UH Manoa, Richard Parsons met his future wife, Laura, and Rainbow Warrior basketball coach, Red Rocha. I think it was frustrating to him because I had talent, um, but I was young, and I hadn't I hadn't fully grown into my own body, and I hadn't developed the the sort of discipline and and focus and sense of real purpose that a, a coach like Red requires. You know, I was still goofing off, right? You know? And so whenever I get into goofing off, boy, he'd get on me. But he was, he was a good man. He was, he was sort of like almost the father figure. I didn't realize this until many years later, but, but when you're young and you sort of pull yourself away from the family, you throw yourself out into the world, the team became like my family and, and Red became the father figure. And so he certainly took to the role, yelling and screaming <laughs> and carrying on. Um, well, you also had another kind of figure. You, you met your, the woman who had become your wife here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was another part of the transition to uh, um, this becoming a place that, for which I have the fondest memories. I met my wife in my, my sophomore year. We were in an English class together and, you know, we dated um, pretty steadily for our sophomore year. We then kind of broke up because she went back home, um, and I didn't that summer. And when she came back in our junior year, we sort of dated off and on, but we didn't really um, get back together in a serious way until my senior year. And then at the end of my senior year, we got married. Young again, still young. Yeah. How old were you? 20. 20 years old. And she's from Oklahoma, you're from New York, and you meet and marry in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Where'd you get married? We got married right down the block at uh, the Church. Um, Church of the Crossroads in Manoa? Yep. Right down the block. My parents did too. So, so now you've graduated and uh, actually you didn't graduate, oh. did you, from the UH? No, I was six credits shy at the end of my four years and I was supposed to go to summer school to get those six credits. But I just, uh, other things came up and I never got around to it. I'd applied to and gotten admitted to law school in, back in New York. And <clears throat> I found out on the way to signing up for those two classes this summer to finish up that I didn't really need to, that, that I got what was called a law school qualifying certificate because I had enough college credits and I'd done well enough on the LSATs and all that sort of thing so that I could just go off and go to law school. So instead of, uh, instead of going to summer school, I worked. And law school was, was relatively easy for me. Because the law, uh, the law is a purely, particularly in those days, almost a purely logical exercise. It's built on, you know, eight or nine hundred years of sort of human experience built around a few simple rules. And it turned out that that apparently my brain works the same way that um, that human experience over time works. Mm. And so I didn't have to. I, I just knew the answers. And so I did very well in law school without having to work too, too hard. And you worked hard on the side. You were a janitor part of the time, right? Yeah, to pay well, that, your was way my, through. that was my first job in the law. I, was a, I used to clean up the law school after everybody went home. Wow. Humbling experience? Well, you know, humbling, you know, it was a job. My mother always told me all work has dignity. So I didn't, in fact, my to this day best friend, that's where I met him, he and I were. We worked in the bookstore 
uh, initially, and then we we talked the su the superintendent of the building, oh. the law school building, into letting us work part time as janitors at night because we needed the money. Right out of law school in 1971, Richard Parsons was offered the job of assistant counsel to then New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. He continued as a much trusted advisor when Rockefeller was appointed vice president to President Gerald Ford. I didn't know Nelson Rockefeller as a, as a political figure. Um, and I liked him. I liked it, but no, I didn't consider myself a Democrat or a Republican. I was, you know, I was a guy who needed a job. Uh, over time, um, I found though that I, I, I agreed with a lot of his political philosophy and leanings, and I would still call myself a Rockefeller Republican. There aren't many of us left. What is a Rockefeller Republican? Well, I think a Rockefeller Republican is somebody who is, who is more conservative on fiscal matters. Um, but understands that government has a role in terms of making lives better for people. So many people call that social liberalism and fiscal conservatism. Now, in, in all of this time we've been talking about your um, early experiences, you haven't once mentioned racism. Nope. Did, have you experienced it? Yeah, but, but certainly not in... Um, in its most virulent form. You know, I was born in the North, not in the South, uh, back in the 40s and 50s and early 60s when, when, uh, and I know this because my grandmother lived in the South and we'd go visit with her in the summertime, when life was very different in the South for blacks. Uh, in the North it was not easy, but it was not so stark, right? And then secondly, um, you know, I went to school in Hawaii, right, undergraduate school, and that was, uh, this was, at least in those respects, a more tolerant, open, embracing, and, 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 and less stratified society. Still is. Uh, and then I got married, and my wife is white. And so we wondered a little bit when we went back to New York in 1968, right, uh, as an interracial couple, but I think in part because of our respective personalities, it just never bit. Um, you know, all those skills that one developed as a kid trying to avoid fights paid off in a way that I would not, not, would not have in, 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 expected. Same principles apply? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's how you approach people. If you can, if you can disarm them, Right? If you can cause them not to feel threatened, not to feel defensive, not to feel challenged. Um, Sounds like you don't take offense easily. I don't. I don't. You because, just let it pass? Because, you know, what happens is, first of all, most things aren't intended um, at a personal level. Mostly, and I, I didn't, by the way, realize much of this until I had my own children. And I saw in my son, my son is, is probably the world's most secure, at least he was. You get older, some of it gets chipped off. But the most secure kid, he just assumed that uh, he was going to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Even as like a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, we'd let him out in the yard and other kids would be out there. And he just weighed in as if, you know, I'm here, right? You know, who isn't going to accept me? And, and so he had no kind of defensive chip on his shoulder that he had to defend. And then secondly, he, he was secure enough to almost mold himself to whatever circumstances he had to, to accommodate somebody else's peculiarities or, 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 or vulnerabilities so that he made other people feel like they didn't have to be defensive either. And I watched him and I realized that I have some of those skills. Of course, when the racism is deliberate, I mean, it is racism, mm -hmm. it's not... Uh ignorance or misinformation about what's going on. It's, you know, I'm focusing my racism upon you. That You, you can't slip away from that. Very no, easily. you can't. You can't. That doesn't happen nearly as much as people think it happens. Um, there is such a thing in America that I call structural racism. Um, it's just, it, it, it sits behind the consciousness. People have, they've been, they've been raised with and they've been reinforced by their experiences in life, they have understandings 
uh, and perceptions about people who are different than them. And that's just a reality of life. That again, that too isn't intended as personal. I actually I had an experience once uh, when I was, this is years after I left Hawaii, when I was in the law firm, I was a hiring partner and I was talking to one of my pals who was on the hiring committee and who was complaining about the fact that that, that you know, we weren't hiring um, a certain kind of person because we I'd made a big deal about being diverse and we started recruiting at, at, at you know uh, historically black colleges and universities for lawyers we started hiring a lot of women and he said to me once um, he said you know well what, but like I introduced so and so and he's uh, he's the kind of person you know he's the kind of person we need to hire because that's what a client is looking for you know he's six foot too, and he's blonde haired and blue eyed and he looked right at me and he said, a real white man. And then he caught himself and he went, he said, he said, Ugh. He said I didn't mean that the way it sounded. Because, you know, this was a pal. But what he was reflecting was a deep-seated perception of the, the way the world is supposed to work. And that, that exists, probably always will. But you can't let that, it's, that's not the sort of overt racism that you were talking about, but it's, it's every bit as pernicious. But you can't let that uh, embitter you or cause you to um, take on more of a burden than you need to to get to where you want to go, right? You just kind of, it's like a boulder in the middle of the path. You just got to figure out how are you going to get around that. And at that time, you were the hiring partner, so you were in the catbird seat anyway. Yeah. Right. I mean, most of these things, I, I, I think to the extent of about 80 percent, people bring a lot of this on themselves, things that they could negotiate around if they were, if they put themselves in the right mindset to do it. Now, every once in a while, though, you do have to stand and fight. And when you do, I don't like to lose that either. Have you done that? Have you stood up to racism? Yeah. You yeah. know? Not, you know, I haven't, I haven't punched anybody, but I haven't had to punch anybody. But you sometimes you just have to do what you got to do, as they say. There's more to the story. Join us next time on Long Story Short for more conversation with Richard Parsons, who reached the highest ranks of corporate power. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA.